Меня зовут Кристина, я сегодня буду модератором красного и потом общего вместе с оранжевым залом. Приветствую вас, уже у нас получается вторая лекция, первый стол был очень интересный, если вы не попали, то это очень жаль. Дальше мы продолжаем с очень интересным спикером, который сам родом из Тайваня, это Айян. Он работает в Big Point и расскажет нам э, о роли киберспорта в процессе разработки. Давайте поприветствуем. Developer validation. This is actually very important, which is basically validating for yourselves as the developers what you're building is correct. Public validation, I call this legitimization. This is basically, hey, is this actually something the public wants to play? Is it actually competitive? Development resource restrictions. Maybe your team is very small, and we're going to talk about ours, uh, but we use esports as a way to basically make up for the fact we didn't have very many people working on the game. And then marketing. So, of course, As you know, for a lot of online games, population is very important. This basically leads to more players. Uh, it's kind of this loop, and it's a way to do alternative marketing. So, something you want to remember is that esports basically is competitive play on all levels. So, there's low-level esports, high-level esports. We're going to start from every single one of these. All right. So, I'm going to go to the very end right now. So, if you guys need to take off, these are the things we actually learned right here. First one. We built the automated features way too early. So these are things like leaderboards, ranked games. You have to be careful about this. We're going to talk about why. This actually helped save a lot of time for us. But for the type of game we were building, it actually did, uh, basically did the work of, I would say, like 10 designers or so. We'll talk about this. Um, we actually had a lot of momentum from our initial pushes, but we didn't keep it up. And this is pretty crucial for us. And then. This is probably the big one here is you can't actually, I know the whole talk is about building an esports game, you can't actually build an esports game. And we'll talk about why this is. So, about us, who I am, my name is Al Yang, I'm the design lead on Shards of War. Uh, we are a top-down shooter MOBA over at Big Point. Uh, I'm the design lead there, we're based in Hamburg. Uh, I have a history of competitive fighting games, I'm working on them, uh, playing them, so I work on the games like Killer Instinct. Uh, for the Xbox uh, as a consultant, also on PlayStation All-Stars, Battle Royale, if you guys play that for PS3. Before that, I was in China working with THQ on a lot of the online games in the Chinese market there. So, this is our team. We have 44 people, uh, including QA, but excluding support. This is how big we are now, but this is not what we were like in the very beginning. We're part of a large established company, so a lot of the things I'm going to talk about relate to us. Uh, the size of our team and the type of game we're building, but this might be different for you based on your team size and your type of game. Most of us have previous dev experience, or, so it's not a completely new team. And this is important too for us. Uh, Big Point has an industry reputation for pay-to-win games, and this is very important for us when we're building out esports. So, validation. What is this? This is basically proving your game is successful in a focused area, something very specific. So, what can you validate? For us, it was the mechanics of the game. Was this actually solid? Balance was a balanced game. Visual appeal, right in the very beginning, it's kind of like a focus test. Is this something that people like just by looking at it? And then the competitive aspect, is the game actually competitive? So what does success look like for us? It's fun, but honestly, how do you measure fun? How do you quantify this? Retention, this is the biggest thing here. You just see retention from the players, especially early game. Community activity, this is where most of the late game stuff comes in. So you might have a lot of players who aren't actually actively playing your game anymore, but you see a lot of activity on your forums, basically a lot of like, you know, YouTube videos, et cetera, et cetera. This is a good way to measure it also. So with retention, we look at two types, early, which is first to seven day. There's, this basically proves a certain set of things. And then your late day, which is 30 day plus. So with our early day retention, what are we looking at here is visuals. Is this something that when people just look at the game, they want to actually play it? Mechanics, is it actually fun? So we're talking about in-game, an early game progression, is this something that players actually want to go through? Uh, our success points here, honestly, is game entry. This is very important. This is something you want to focus on, is the tech, specifically the stability. To be very honest with you, if you focus on nothing else early game, focus on your tech and the fun. So interesting fact for you, um, we had a 
70% on shards of war, 70% launcher churn. So that means only 30% out of 100% of the people that actually re registered for the game, 70% of these people never made it past the launcher download phase. That's huge. All right. So even before you think about if the game is fun or not, make sure that you have a really, really good stability, especially on your launcher. So that's, again, 70% of the people never even made it into the game to try it out. So again, focus on your tech in this early point. Uh, good examples for this, if you've seen Heroes of the Storm, they do a very, very good job with this on their early game retention. Or if you've seen Lost Odyssey for Xbox 360, it's an older game. I can't believe I just said old game and Xbox 360. That makes me feel really old. Um, but basically it does everything right. If you're looking for like the first 15 minute experience, both these games do this very, very well. So I urge you to check this out. For our late game retention, this is basically 30 day plus. This is basically when your players have said, hey, this game is fun. How do we keep them around? This is where balance comes in. You don't even want to worry about balance in the very beginning. Um, this is only something that your competitive players are going to care about. Again, competitive play. Your progression loops. Is there something that wants to, that keeps them going, keeps them playing? So what do we focus on here in our success points? First thing is sticky progression. So this is basically, hey, again, is that progression loop good? Do I want to keep playing? Is there something that keeps me going uh, with the esports? Without the esports, it has to be there. Community activity. This is, again, for us, the biggest measure. Content creation, discussion. It doesn't matter if you, your CCU is not increased as super high at this point in time from these players. It's that they are basically engaged with the community constantly. This is what we call our true game CCU. So we actually, for our late game, we don't just look at how many people are playing. We look at these guys who have played maybe like once a week, maybe two times a week, but we see basically like how much discussion is generated here. So Dota 2 is a good example for you guys. If you look at kind of Dota 2 forums on, on the internet compared to something like League of Legends, for example, look on Reddit. League of Legends has over twice uh, what Dota 2 has, but the Dota 2 community generates actually way more content. And for us, this is kind of a measure of success that the game is growing, that your high-level players are actually more engaged. So how do you test validation? This basically starts during your development, never ends. So this is something that's always ongoing. You have to understand that there are different types of this and then that each of these layers has a different takeaway. I'm going to go through these real quick and tell you what we found there and what was interesting to us. So when you think of validation, it's kind of like you're building a house. All right, You start from the base and you go up. You got to build each layer first or else the later ones don't matter. So these are the five types. I'm going to go through these uh, one by one now. So theoretical, what is this for us? This is basically starting with your internal team testing. This is basically in development. This is when this happens with your alpha builds. All right. For us, what this, what this basically came out in is on play tests and kind of our team tournament series. <clears throat> so for us, the takeaways here is, is it fun to us? This is very important. Because at this point in your development, it's like, do we move ahead on this? This is your first turn back point. If it's not fun to the team, if it's not competitive, you throw it away. This is the place where you just wipe it and start all over. All right? You're going to save a lot of time and frustration by figuring this out. At this point in time, you have to have a coherent vision. What is the end game for the, for the, basically the product? But the important thing is, what is a good player? This is where you basically define where your core gameplay comes up. Because at this point in time, what's high level play? You don't know. All right? But you have to take the best shot at trying to figure this out. Does your team have confidence that this is high level play? Honestly, though, the things you got to watch out here is with your team members, you have a direct stake in this project. Maybe you're not fans of this type of game. Maybe you're making a fighting game. Maybe you're making a shooter. Your team, none of your team members, maybe half of them like shooters, so you can get a lot of mixed opinions, especially at this point in time. So be very careful about this. You're going to have to convince them of the vision and exactly define what is high-level play. Have any of you guys seen Overwatch, this game that's coming out right now from Blizzard? Nobody? A couple of you guys. All right. This is a really good example. So if you take a look and just watch this game right now, this is what I mean by what exactly is high-level play. They've already put this out. The developers think they have something, which is like, oh, we have a balanced team, which is you know, like one support, one tank, you know, X attack characters. But then when you actually get to competitive play now, it's like three tanks, three supports. This is not what they expected. All right? you could, this is the point where you define it, but your players decide what's going to be high-level right now. So again, a good example to take a look at this is always new competitive games coming out. For us, we had unstable test times. This is where you do fast iterations. Again, you move very fast in this stuff. For our initial kind of validation, we had a lot of company-wide testing, again, with the alpha builds. And we did some internal tournaments for this. 
takeaways here is, is it fun to other people? It's fun to your team right now. That's good, all right? But these people don't have a direct stake. They may be part of your company, they're not part of your team, all right? They'll be like, oh yeah, you know, what's, what are those guys working on? That's kind of cool, but they're not like, ah, oh, this, is, this is my project, all right? So, but this is where you basically prove is the core solid, because the, these people are not, not gonna tell you, hey, oh yeah, I think it's, I think it's fun. They're gonna be like, oh, this, this is not good, and, you know, what, what are you guys doing over here? All right, this is your, honestly, your first gauge of interest. For those of you guys in a bigger team, this is where you're gonna find this out. For those of you guys who are like smaller, much more independent studios, I mean like under 10 people, or around 10, 20 people, not part of a big team, this is where your focus groups are very important. All right, this is the first time you're gonna see outside strategies. I'm gonna talk about this a little bit because quite honestly, and this is dangerous, everybody has their own kind of play style. It's very difficult to kind of break out from this. You always do things the same way. And this is why you want to push things out to the public, out into kind of the esports, the competitive realm as soon as possible. All right. So dangers we have here is, again, you're going to get some emotion attachment. Maybe it's they're part of your company, friends, family. They're still, they still want you to succeed. All right. So they, they might be a little bit nicer. All right. So just keep this in mind. Um, at this point in time, especially when you're showing to the rest of your company, resist business-oriented decisions at this point in time, all right? You really want to focus on the fun. If the game is not fun just to some random person you, know, you just basically give the game to, it's not going to work. Again, you have irregular tests because the first time you're showing stuff to people, you get these wow moments. You know, be careful of this. <clears throat> Past this, we do external focus testing, all right? This is the first time we push the game out to the public. That's what we call our casual validation. This is polished alpha beta builds. And there's a key word on polished because you really want to focus, especially when you look, look at people, look at stuff for the first time. If it's temp, yeah, to the developers, it's fine. But to the outside, it's going to be dangerous. I know, I know like you've probably heard this like a thousand times, but it's so true, you got to really watch out for that. So the, this is the first time you're going to hear this, which is, is this fun to our target group? This is why focus tests are so important to you guys, all right? And not just focus groups, but make it competitive, all right? There's, they have, these guys have a connection to the genre. <clears throat> this is where you basically do your fine tuning and your core validation. If you don't, if this wrong, what went wrong, this is the second time you can go back. At this point, if, you, if it's not fun, if, the, if your target group doesn't like it, this is the time to just stop, go back. Anything further than this, you shouldn't do it. This is basically your fresh look. There's no stake there. This is a fun thing I like to do. So how many of you guys actually do focus tests? Like raise your hands for your company. <clears throat> nope, a couple people, all right. So quite honestly, even with focus tests, I'm gonna tell you that people have a little bit of a skewed view because they're being paid to do this. Maybe they know the company already. Maybe they like the particular type of project. Something I like to do is to pose as one of the testers. So I actually go into the focus group with the testers, like, all my guys are there and they're doing the test. I play the game with them. They don't know I'm part of the development team. Um, we do this, uh, this is the, the second time we've done this at a company. And then you just go in and you play the game with them. And honestly, you just talk shit about your own game the entire time. All right, you're like, I hate this, this is stupid, I don't like this, like this isn't fun. Because as you guys know, you have a, like a large mob mentality when a lot of people say they like something, it's probably gonna, usually gonna go that way. But the interesting thing to do is see how people react to when you're talking about your own game, all right? The things to really watch out for is if they agree with you or if they try to defend your points. If you're like, oh, this character is stupid or like, I, I really don't like this shooting mechanic. It feels terrible. Why didn't they do it like this game? If someone defends it, listen to why they defend it. If someone is agreeing with you, listen to that too. It's actually a really good way to get unfiltered feedback. Of course, you can't really do this too often because once after you get known, that's it. Um, like if Miyamoto or like Kojima went into like Kojima went into like a test for like Metal Gear Solid and someone saw them there, that would not work at all. So if, so they, if you're really well known in your circles, get one of your guys to do this. It's a really, really good way to get feedback. A really good way to get feedback. <clears throat> so again, do this at your own risk. It might backfire on you. Hasn't happened to us yet, but it might. So dangerous here is you got to do this early in dev. Like I said, this is your second turnaround point. All right, very short hands-on time here. You have the initial wow factor. Again, first time seeing a brand new game, it's gonna be skewed, this is why. Again, putting in one of your own guys as a play tester and then getting that feedback is actually very, very interesting. Um, people usually focus on the visuals and it's a closed environment. So that's the, that's the only thing I can say, is focus on this early, be careful. Now this is where it starts getting interesting. 
So this is basically where the core validation starts. This is when you push your game out live. It's the first time you get live environment data. <clears throat> for us, this is closed open beta, and we did a bunch of features for this too. So basically, ranked games, tournaments, leaderboards. So interesting thing for you, the first time we did a community uh, event, we actually did this with streamers. Also, we saw a 300% initial CCU upsurge. So this is a thing we call Community Cup. We do this every week, and it's just getting a bunch of players to go together. 300%. That was really huge for us. But we did this every single week, lowered every single time to the point after about six weeks, we never, we didn't see any change in CCU. But for the first six times, six weeks we did this, we saw a huge increase there, uh, especially on the first time. But really, you really have to keep your momentum going on this. So takeaways here is, is again, is this actually fun to your target group? Now you're actually playing this. You're not watching anybody anymore. They're playing by themselves. It's not moderated. This is where we get our retention validation. All right. So this is where you're looking at your early retention, your first look at the funnel points. So some things you got to watch out for here is this is really good for lower level play, especially when the game is just coming out fresh. You got to, you're going to have a very vocal group. So again, as designers, as, the, as basically as developers, what's the actual feedback you're getting here? Okay. Uh, sometimes this depends on the quality of your traffic pool. So this is matchmaking. This is very, very important for us. As you guys know, and this, here's, a, here's a hint for you guys, players are going to give you better results. It doesn't matter how good your matchmaking algorithm is. Like, you can have the best matchmaking algorithm in the world. If you don't have players to back that up, at least enough players for your type of game, it's going to be terrible. So focus more of your time on the game itself than matchmaking. So this is, again, for you developers at this point in time. Uh, you can have a terrible matchmaking formula and have a lot of players, and it'll work out. All right. So on our streamer side, we actually had a lot of interesting stuff happen. This is when people, people start actually getting used to your game. So they're saying, hey, this is our tor core target group. You're going to do a lot of fine tuning for them. There's higher level play. This is, and this is where basically esports stuff starts to come in. Because they're playing at a competitive level, this is where you start to get good hidden balance feedback. All right. How many of you guys are designers in here? Raise your hands. Couple of you guys, okay. Any of you guys working on strategy games or like action games? Nothing. Okay. So there's something I like to call spreadsheet balance. Uh, this has been done for a very, very long time uh, by a lot of us, which is, hey, you put a spreadsheet out there and you're saying, okay, you put all the damage values, you put like things like, hey, it does stun, it has maybe special effects, it slows, and you balance them. So it's like maybe 10 points of damage is equal to like one second of slow or something like that. This is spreadsheet balance. This looks good on paper, but it almost never, ever, ever works. Um, this is something I think the Asia Empires guys have been doing for a very long time. So again, the real question is how many, how much range, like every meter of range, how much damage is that equal to, or et cetera, these type of questions. You're not going to answer these by yourself in your team on that spreadsheet. The only way you're going to do this is to put the game out there and have people test this, but not just normal people. This is where you get your high-level players. This is where the competitive play comes out because these are the guys that actually get angry about this kind of stuff. They rage all the time on your forums, in the game, and it's important. You listen to them, you gather analytics, and when you do the streamers, when you actually do like the high-level players, you can pull this kind of data out of your analytics. You can actually throw away all the low-level data and be like, I'm not going to worry about anybody under this level or anybody under this ELO range. I'm just concerned about pulling the data from this high-level ELO range and using that to balance the game. And honestly, that's the easiest thing. We have spent days and like months trying to figure out exactly this, which is how much range reduction is equal to like a damage increase. All right? And the easiest way is to just get it into competitive play and pull the analytical data. That being said, you should build an analytics back system really, really soon, especially before you launch. All right. So, dangerous here is these guys are very passionate, they're very vocal, they have extremely narrow focus. That's what I mean. Yeah, you can listen to them, you can see the forums. On the forums, you can get a general sense of what's broken, what's wrong, what you need to balance, but you need the analytical data to back it up because they might be complaining about something, but that's actually not really the case. You have to, you have to listen to what they're actually saying, what they're actually doing here. You're not going to get much feedback on, hey, what's wrong with the game in the early stage. It's more about balance. <clears throat> For us, the final validation is on the competitive level, um, which is controlled environment data. All right. So for us, closed open beta, 
We did tournament series, which is every week we basically have a moderated tournament. And we had an invitational, where we invited players to come over and play the game. And we had a thing called Battle of the Shards, which is a big Gamescom tournament. The important thing about all this stuff compared to everything else you're seeing before is two things. And these are the things that bring out the worst in people, but something you want to pay attention to is, one, these things had money involved or prizes. This is actually really important. And the second thing is these are all moderated, so we're watching all of these the entire time. So takeaways here is this is basically what you, can your core target group really do. This is the kind of the highest level of play balance. This is important because this shows what is possible. How would I put it? It's kind of like playing an instrument. If you listen to someone play the piano and he's not that good, you're like, ah, piano isn't a really good instrument. But if you see someone who can play the piano and he's excellent at it, he's like amazing, you're like, wow, this is an incredible instrument. I wish I could play that good. This is the same thing with your competitive players. They basically show you how good the instrument your game can be. Because if people don't see really cool stuff happening in your game, they, they want to be like, I want to get to that level of play. It doesn't work. Um, and this is why you want to get these high-level guys in, promote them, get them streaming, do these tournaments as soon as possible. For us, the tournaments was a way to get these guys all together in one place and show this off. We call this kind of the aspirational audience effect. I'm so amazed. Wow, look at these really amazing people. I want to be as good as them. And then we just, we just use eSports as the platform to promote this. Now, again, you have those wow moments there. But again, for you developers, this is kind of the final step, which is, did you really do everything right? Now, this is actually really important. Because up to this point in time, your developers are like, oh, we've, we've done a good job. We think we've done the right thing. But up until this point, you actually can't really tell if you've done the right thing. Um, for us, this is like right choices were made. And that's the other thing is with money, because money is involved in these kind of things. This usually brings out the worst in people, which means it brings out the worst strategies, the top level strategies, and this really helps with your balance also. So again, these people are usually very passionate, they're very vocal, there's a very delicate balance going on, it's expensive. So for a lot of you smaller studios, if you're going to do this kind of stuff, this does take money. Sometimes it's not worth it, especially the live tournaments. And again, your players have a stake in the game because now they're playing for money. All right? And this is when, usually when, if the game is broken, they're going to be much, much, much more vocal about this. So. Legitimization. Any of you guys know this, this song? No? No MC Hammer? Oh wow, I'm dating myself. Okay, let's move on. So what is legitimization is, is this basically makes the game legitimate in the eyes of serious players. Remember, eSports is a high level of retention feature. Whatever you think about, you don't build this as the very, very, very first thing. You can use it in the beginning. And when you think about it, up until now, I didn't really talk about the competition aspects of eSports. We're talking about what eSports comp competitive play, what eSports did for us development-wise. But the end, eSports really is a high-level retention feature. Everything you're building up to that point should be an engagement feature because up in, you can't really do this until you're at the very highest level. <clears throat> so what do we do? All right, no one really knows who Big Point is in terms of eSports. We haven't done this kind of thing before. So we partnered with the ESL. All right, this is the first thing because Shards of War, what game is this? All right, it's not big in the esports scene. We are an unknown entity. What we call this is legitimization by association. So that means, hey, ESL does this ESL1, they do Dota 2. Dota 2 is another MOBA, very well known. Just by having our name on there, on the ESL bracket, it's kind of like, hey, these guys are legitimate. They're working with the, they're working with the same people as Dota 2, as Counter-Strike Go, et cetera, et cetera. This is very important, especially for a lot of you smaller guys. Yeah, you can just do a tournament series. You can just do kind of your own thing. But if you want to have people pay attention in the very beginning, it's actually a good idea to go with someone who's known. All right. And the other thing is they have a tournament infrastructure. Um, if you look at brackets, you look at tournament structures, you can build this yourself. But for the pro players, when they come in and they see this, this is very important, especially when you're trying to attract uh, esports teams. So. If you don't have a good infrastructure, it's not going to help out at all. So another question is, do we need another MOBA? That's the question we asked ourselves. And this is love the answers is, if your top level players don't want to play this, what about your casual players? So you want to get this out there as soon as possible. That's where we started our tournaments very, very early. This is to kind of gauge interest in the game itself in the type of genre. All right? So for those of you guys who are building games in a very crowded market space, this is a very 
a very good idea is to go into esports very early to go into the competitive play early because yes people want to play it because if it's not fun if it's not competitive it's actually not mechanically interesting they're not going to want to kind of want to play it then your game at that point in time is kind of stuck so for those of you guys doing tournaments something very big that ha helps we did an invitational where we invited specific esports teams a mix of esports teams and people from our high level brackets winning by a known player really really helps out for this all right so an example there's a game called rising thunder out there um recently they went to a big tournament so-called regionals this guy called f champ won but he was basically a top level fighting game player he won a lot of tournaments because of this people look at the game and they go ah it's a real fighting game there's real skill involved because a known player who is actually known at being good at this game won and this helped out a lot for us, the same thing happened at Gamescom. We had a group called Team Epsilon win, which is a known, this is very interesting, they're not a MOBA team, they are a shooter team, specifically from Counter-Strike. Because of this and them winning, we actually got a huge increase in traffic from not MOBA players, but from shooter players. So players who are interested in Counter-Strike, players who are interested in this team, they were like, hey, this shooter team won this MOBA game that's really interesting why would that happen maybe there's something going on here they say they're a top-down shooter they must be a real shooter so we actually got a huge traffic boost from that and this is basically because we specifically invited these guys over here it's a great way to do because of this it's a great way to do alternative marketing not just from the players themselves but from the teams that these players have reached to so at this point in time we actually had a 220 percent increase in CCU from just these guys winning and then basically the news spreading out. Uh, we increased 550% as a trending topic on Google searches at this point in time in relation to the game and shooters. Um, however, we didn't keep this up. The next month we actually lost 320% of this trending topic. Um, so this basically just goes to show you, yeah, you're gonna get, these things are gonna give you the initial push, but you've gotta really, really keep it going, all right? Um, but you'll notice that with this, we had a 220% increase in CCU compared to 300% in our online tournaments. So was it worth it? We'll talk about that in a little bit. So again, keep your momentum. Besides the CCU, a lot of this was actually mostly reflected in the social media among the players. Like you said, 220% 200, increase in CCU, but 500, 500 like 50% plus increase in kind of just the trending topics on the social media. We had a large increase in user-created content, so about a 300% increase just from this tournament. All right, nothing before, just from this specific tournament. This really helped kickstart a variety factor. This will keep you going. All right, but you got to keep up the pace. I can't stress this enough. Do the big push. Keep up the pace. You can't just do a big push and just do nothing for a while and do a big push, nothing for a while. It's better to do a big push and then several small pushes. All right. So, this is actually a really interesting topic for us. Uh, on the pay to win thing. So big point, if you guys, how many of you guys know big point or are familiar with big point? All right. So we have a very big pay to win reputation. This is because of our browser game history. A lot of you guys at basically older companies who have a reputation uh, might see this yourselves or you might see a reputation attached to your company. So pre games compressed, we got a lot of stuff which is like, this is a big point game. So it's pay to win. All right. That's the actual quote. Post Gamescom, we had stuff like we were pleasantly surprised at the game. All right? And this is, again, mostly in part to the tournament we held, basically showing off that legitimate teams want to play the game and showing off the type of gameplay. All right? Even if we didn't do this on the floor by kind of doing the kind of the online tournament series, partnering with ESL, again, with ESL, you're thinking, hey, they wouldn't do a pay to win game here. And again, that's the kind of mentality, even if it's not entirely true, that's the mentality you want for your players going in that they see that kind of thing. It's like if you see, I don't know, if you see a product at a really fancy store, it might be the same product at like, like your kiosk or in a really fancy department store. Just because it's in a department store, people are going to think it's a much better thing. So story for you, uh, there is an example of a violin player uh, in Washington, D.C. He's basically world class. The violin he was using was Stradivarius. It's like a million dollar plus violin. Um, usually plays in concert halls. He went and played in the subway. No one paid attention to him. He's not any worse at his job. He's still like one of the world's top violin players. But the place you see him, again, the place you see your tournament, the place you see 
uh, where your esports is going on really helps determine what people are going to think about you. It's just association by branding. It's a really big deal. <clears throat> so going on time and resource restrictions, I'll we'll move a little faster here. We had a short development time. We turned this game around in six, about six to nine months was our total development time on this, which is not very much time at all. The game existed previously, but we had to turn it into something new. So we didn't have many resources, no design, no testing. We had about 30 team members at this point in time. We had no play testers at this point in time. We actually had no one testing the game. The people testing the game had to be the developers. And as you guys know, this is actually very expensive to use developer time to test your game. All right. We had a couple tests, but we made sure we wanted to launch our beta early. So let's keep moving. So just a quick time calculation for balance. This is very rough, so bear in mind here. So we say one designer, some initial design. That's about 200 man hours. After some testing, it's a, this is a PvP MOBA, so it's a five on five. So you need 10 testers for this, about 1,600 man hours. This is really rough. So let's say 1,800 man hours just to balance that first just one character. Really rough there. Just for the initial balance. And again, we are a small studio for this type of game. Again, this might be different based on what type of game you guys are making. But the, our goal here really was to launch a fun feature. So something for you guys, especially for you guys who want to make a perfect game, you're never even going to launch close to being balanced or bug free. This is an impossible world here. I mean, there's these big AAA games out there, Destiny. World of Warcraft, even League of Legends, League of, which have like thousands of thousands of people working on them, they don't even launch. They don't even launch bug free. All right, something's going to come out. It's going to be broken. So stop thinking this is going to happen. Just focus on making your feature fun. All right, and not obviously broken. You can just fix. You can fix this afterwards. This is kind of the reality of the thing. And the main reason is you really want to farm this kind of stuff out. You want to player source your high level balance. Again, a rough calculation. Let's say you just have you have 3,000 players playing one game, about 18-minute game. So, in two games, you have 900 man hours. That's about in two games. That's in two. Sorry, in 900. That's 900 man hours in two games. That's about one month full testing. So, if you build a good analytics system and you get this high-level data out there, get these high-level players playing, they're going to figure out stuff way faster than you ever will. It doesn't matter how much time you guys spend in the studio. Get it out there. Just make sure it's not broken. Let these guys do the testing for you. Again, these are situations your team can't get into, can't fathom. And this is because people usually have fixed play styles or thought patterns. This is just how we work. We always think the same way. If you play a game, you always want to try to play it the same way, same type of character. A lot of people have trouble thinking outside the box in this regards. We are no different, especially developers. When we make a character, when we make a feature, we think it's supposed to work this specific way. But then the really interesting stuff is to see how players take that and change it. So no matter how much you test, no matter how much your team tests, you're not going to figure everything out. Just put it out there because you're not going to see the true potential of whatever it is you're making. <clears throat> your player blades is always going to be better than your team for testing. This is why you want to get it out there, especially to high level guys, because they're going to figure this out much faster than you. All right. The key here is make sure there's good communication. For us, we did weekly streams. This is direct news, spreads down very fast. Forums, make sure you do a fast turnaround. The players have to feel like you are listening. That's the key thing here. It has to be fast, but they have to feel like you're listening. For our balance goals, we actually did something very interesting, which is our Sentinel items. We have items that change the way a character plays. We actually use this to hide balance. So actually what we did is we kept part of the, uh, the character design back a little bit. For the first two weeks, we basically released these, th released these characters, watched the analytics, made sure the high-level players got into this, made sure our goal was no more than a 60% win rate in any specific bracket. This is four for us. So this is a thing for balance on you guys. If you see one character and like at low level, he's really strong, at high level, he's not very strong, that's okay. You don't need to balance for that. All right. Just make sure he's fun because you're not always going to get. You're not going to make a character who is always good across every single level. This is almost impossible. It's just going to happen. If you look at big games, Dota, League of Legends, Street Fighter, Marvel vs. Capcom, you're always going to see the same, like few characters played at a high level. This is okay. All right. As long as the rest of those characters are fun. If you play League of Legends like Teemo, Teemo is not competitive, but he's a fun character to play. That's fine. Keep him balanced for that specific bracket, but make sure they're good somewhere. All right? 
What we just did then is we just rebalanced, released these items. We use this to basically patch missing gameplay, patch missing balance. It's an interesting thing for us. We found that a two-week kind of balanced content cycle was the best thing for our players, which is every two weeks, a piece of content every two weeks, uh, basically balanced. And this is a really good way to kind of keep this going if you don't have enough, how to say, manpower on your team. Because balance is honestly also a type of content for the players, but this is something the players can help you test while you're working on the content yourself. So, what we did here is basically use our tournaments to balance. So your developers will almost never be better than the players. Again, that's the key thing. If you're working on the game, you shouldn't be better than your players at the game because of your, because of the particular thought style and just the time you spend playing the game versus making the game. You need that high level feedback. So we did a thing called the Go For Cup. This basically happened every week with a big tournament at the end of the month. Um, again, when we talk about these tournaments, they are constant player aspiration is something players, especially high level players, look forward to every single week. They're like, okay, we're gonna practice for this. It's just like an instrument, it's like a concert. Every week there's a concert, you practice for your concert, all right? And this is good because it generates a lot of content, it generates a lot of streams, and this basically lets the more casual players see, hey, what's possible, all right? We, did, we basically bolstered this with a lot of stuff like uh, we basically did highlight videos, kind of plays of the stream, et cetera, et cetera. So again, because we didn't have very many people, this is a way for us to catch broken gameplay because let's be honest, if something is really broken, you're compl some of your players are gonna complain about it, but if people know stuff, they're just gonna use it and they're not gonna say anything, all right? So we incentivized this high level play right away. Basically every tournament had a cash prize to it but it was observed closely by the dev team. So every week when this tournament happened, we just all sit there and watch it and be like, okay, what's going on? It's basically a moderated, compressed time frame. Because yeah, you could, just you could just have people play the game, hop on every once in a while, see what's going on, look at analytics, but to actually observe is much more valuable because even with analytics, there are things you can't catch here. So because of this, every weekend, we basically have a couple hours to just sit there watch the game, see what the high level players are doing. And because there was money involved, it would basically give away 350 euros each week. This was completely worth it to us because people were playing for money. Basically usually brought out the worst in people. They used the worst cheats or like the worst ways to play. And this is basically how you can tell, oh, is this character actually fun? Is the game actually working? Is the balance actually there? Because honestly, once the money is involved, players don't care about being fair anymore. They just care about winning. It comes out to that next level. All right. So before you, we have a return on investment on Nemesis. This is a, one of the characters we have for the game. He had a 70% win rate based on our analytics. That's crazy. That's pretty much, if you see that, this means your character is broken. All right. So we had seen this previously before in a character called Vox, uh, one of our first characters, but we had no tournaments yet. Back then, it took us about three months to balance this character, which is insane. When this happened, basically what we said is, all right, we don't think he's broken, and if he is, we're not quite sure why he's so strong, because he looks normal to us. And then we said, okay, we're just gonna let him go with the tournament. There's money involved, people are like oh, complaining, they're like, okay, geez, there's a lot of stuff going on here. So by doing this, has actually saved us about two to three months of balance testing. We just let him go to the tournament, he actually lost. He was not the strongest character at that point in time because there were counter strategies. It's just all the 70% win rate was happening with players who didn't really understand what was going on. After the tournament, we actually saw a lot of this information go on the leaderboard, uh, go onto our forums, and it basically went, he went down to about a I want to say like a 55% win rate at that point in time. Just from this, you need these, you need these players basically doing these tournaments, look at, looking at this kind of stuff. Again, players have their own mindset. They're going to play their own specific way. Your high-level players help to expose hidden strategies. This is a tier list from a game called Injustice. came out a few years ago, but something really interesting here is you see on number 14 is a character called Deathstroke. This guy used to be complained. When he first came out, he was like the most broken character. No one knew how to deal with him. He was like, okay, this guy's broken. After the first major tournament uh, in this game, uh, there's a high-level player that basically shut this guy down. He's like, oh, all I'm going to do is just block and do this one thing. And suddenly the guy went from number one to number 14, like almost instantly. All right. This is one of the things we're talking about. You might not be able to know what 
that is going on. You might not be able to find the best strategy, but your high-level players are, and this, they basically teach everybody else about the game. So this is actually very important too. So this is why you want to get the game in their hands as soon as possible. So I'm running out of time, so I'll run through this a little bit quicker. Um, we did things like leaderboards, kind of early access to promote play. Again, money, this always brings out the worst in people. Uh, we rushed this. We did it in one month. All right. So again, the question here is with money, this, we thought it would be a good idea because we did it with our moderated stuff, with our tournaments. So we did it with the leaderboards too. But again, we knew it would bring out the worst in people because we wanted to do this with kind of cheating, cue dodging to see what people were doing. Um, but we made a mistake here because this was on all the time. People knew we weren't watching all the time. So they were much, much, much more aggressive in doing this. Uh, everybody was in the same queue. There was no hiding from this. Another big mistake we did. So honestly, it hurt our high-level players more, way more than it helped. The same thing, we basically did the same thing where we watched a tournament and we did this and then we just put it out live. It actually dropped our player satisfaction index by about 22%. So it actually hurt a lot. Interestingly, this did not have a huge effect on our CCU. It dropped it by a little bit, but it actually didn't hurt. Players were just unhappy, but they didn't leave. So this is very interesting to us. This is kind of our high-level guys, mostly. Again, we pushed this out before it was ready. <clears throat> so because this is automated, this needs a lot more attention, all right? It's because they know you're not watching. So there's that phrase, when the cat is away, the mice will play. We like to call this the speed camera effect. If people know you're watching, they're going to be acting a specific way. When they know you're not, you get a totally different behavior. So be very careful about this, especially when it comes to competitive. So something we want to do is, if you're going to do something, make sure you have split queues. Make sure this is opt-in. If you're under time constraints, fight for this feature. Label it as a beta. These tags hugely affect player perceptions, especially in esports, especially in competitive play. If you say it's broken, you, you want your players to say, oh, it's still in beta, so they're still testing this. They're still working on it. Even if it's not, I would always launch something with that beta tag because you're never quite sure how something is going to be broken when it first comes out. All right. I mean, look at Heroes of the Storm. It's still in beta for like over a year. It's Blizzard. All right. It's a huge product there. They have what do they say they have over like 120 people on the team. It doesn't matter. Everything's going to be broken in the beginning. This is a way to soften it for people. So again. If you go in and you do this and you don't put in this tag, you're going to get low CCUs. This does make the game look dead. So be careful about that. So if there's any advice I have for you guys based on this automated stuff too, is if you're going to use money, if you can do prizes for this, keep this out of your testing. If you do participation, that's OK. But don't do top place prizes like first, second, third. Get this kind of money because that's when you get that rampant cheating. Make sure you're ready for this. And again. This is something big for you guys. So it's worse to do this wrong than at all. So if you're going to do this, make sure you do it right. Do n never rush any kind of competitive feature because this is the thing that your players are going to get on you the most for. Stability is not an option. You got to make sure this works. Going back to the beginning, we had the example 70% churn rate even before you got through the launcher. All right. Same, if the same thing happens here, you're going to drop the CCU for your high level guys. It's basically the same thing. So we're going to end this up. Would we do this again? All right. There's a lot of stuff we covered very fast. These slides will be online. You can kind of go, you can go through this. It'll probably be a little bit easier to follow. Um, yes. So our best return on investment was validation. We didn't have enough members on our team. We didn't have enough time. We weren't sure exactly if players wanted what we were doing. So that on the balance, the weekly online tournaments, that was probably the best thing we did out of all this stuff. We went, into, we went into the esports realm really early. We did these tournaments because, again, you put money on the line just a little bit, but you see what players are doing. You get to watch them. It's all in one time frame. You don't have to look at data constantly. All right? This worked because we had a smaller team. It was a good PR turnaround for the company. It was basically purchasing street cred, but for us, it was worth it. Um, but, again, like we said, it was too early for a lot of these items, leaderboards especially. We had a lot of wasted momentum from our events. It, just, it had a lot of good pushes in the beginning. CCU went up, but just didn't go fast enough. Live tournaments, if you guys are going to do this kind of stuff, I would wait. When we did this, it just honestly did, was not good enough. PR could have been covered by press demos, et cetera. We spent too much money on that kind of stuff. We actually got a better return on our online tournaments than this. 
and we try too hard to legitimize ourselves. This is very important. So, to wrap up, honestly, you can build for esports, but you just can't build an esports title. This is something a lot, a lot of people talk about. Like, we'll build an esports game. No, you can't. All right, you can build a competitive game, but you can't build an esports game. This is something your players decide. All you can do is build a fun game, make a competitive, something with obvious skill in it. I have a video here. I'll sh I'll skip this real quick, but let's see here. So. With obvious skill, what I mean is like when you see a fighting game, stuff like combos, how much life you have, very obvious. You can just watch someone play and be like, wow, that guy is good. It's like when you watch someone play an instrument, you can be like, oh, they're very good at this instrument. You need that obvious skill there. But you need hidden skill too. So like fighting games, it's footsies. MOBAs, you can see people hit their skill shots all the time. They have a high CS. Map awareness is like an invisible skill there. Puzzle games, chains, setup, racing, kind of doing drifts, your turns, looking at control. You got to build this into your game. People have to be able to see your game and be like, "Hey, that guy is good." They don't need. They need to. See, they need to be able to know that someone is good at your game without knowing how the game works. That's just how it is. It's like if you watch football, you see someone carry the ball all the way down the field. You see them dodge shots. You're not exactly sure what they're doing. You're not exactly sure what the rules of the game are, but you know they're good. All right. That's the most important thing you can do when building an esports game. So again, your players decide if the game is esports or not. Mechanics have to lift the game perception. So you can't just say stuff like, "Hey, esports games can't have random mechanics in there. They can't just have like d dice rolling." That's not true because Hearthstone is technically esports, and that's what I mean by your players decide if it is or not. The most you can do is build a fun game that fit the mechanics. For card games, yeah, there's a random element in there. People are okay with that. For fighting games, not so much. For MOBAs, not so much. So. What you can do is basically maximize this, build for your players. Do not rush. Again, I can't, I can't stress this enough. Automated stuff or things where you aren't watching, do not rush this. It's better to not build this stuff at all. All right, and make sure your game is stable because if your game isn't stable, none of this stuff is going to matter, especially when it comes to tournaments. You don't want your tournament, you don't want your ranked games to be interrupted like every five minutes because your server went down or one guy crashed. This makes people rage quit. This will actually drop your CCU. So, that's it. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, I'm Al Yang from Big Point. Сейчас раз, раз, так. Мы продолжим. Задаем вопросы спикеру. Я думаю, у вас появились. Не переживайте, у нас волонтер может помочь с переводом. Hi, thank you for your presentation. It's really, really good. Uh, and my question is, I see that uh, many games should be changed to be good for eSports. Uh, yeah. Uh, is it, is eSport good change to be good for games? I think so. <clears throat> so the, the biggest thing we say is aspirational. So in this kind of day and age, YouTube is really big. I think most kids in the U.S. I know for sure, like YouTube is starting to overtake traditional TV as a kind of form of media. You actually see toys like Minecraft toys in stores based on YouTube stars. So there's a lot of kids that can watch YouTube. It's pretty much video on demand. You just kind of go on there and see this kind of stuff. And it's the same thing as like they watch their favorite games, or if there's a new game, they'll look at it. Um, especially if they want to see something cool. All right. So esports, like we said, what it does is it gets your highest level players out there. You get the people playing the instrument the best. No one wants to go to a concert and see okay musicians. You want to go to a concert and see the best musicians. This is the fastest way to get these best people out there because it gives the best people incentive to actually play the game, to play the game at the highest level. And because of this, you can see the people who want to play the game will see the highest level and they'll be like, that's really cool. I want to do that. That's where the obvious skill comes into. I want to do that. I want to be as good as this guy. Let's try the game out. So yeah, I think it's actually a really good thing. Uh, and not just esports, but just high level play or high level skill being shown for any type of game. Thank you. Thank you. I have a 
Yesterday was a talk about eSport and uh, there was an interesting statement that uh, if you want uh, your game became an eSport, you have to have a, a really good spectators mode because uh, people want to see how uh, good players play in their perspective. And for example, why World of Tanks is not a really good eSport because hey, they have a shitty spectator mode. And, what do you think about its statement and how things go in your game? I think that's absolutely true. Um, I do agree with that. If Again, if you look at games now, like if you look at Overwatch, their spectator mode is just a guy with a camera, controlling camera with WAST running around. It looks terrible. All right. The main thing you want to do with spectator mode is, again, it's kind of like we said the concert. You have to have a good stage. For me, spectator mode is the stage on which the performers if you can't tell what people are doing, if you can't tell what is actually going on, especially in a team game, it doesn't matter how good your players are because it's just going to become messy. So yeah, that's, I think it's a pretty big key there. That being said, there are some games where the spectator mode is a little bit optional. So like fighting games, you're always there at the same time. That's fine. It's from the perspective of the players, it's okay. On a MOBA, in some cases, you can get away with just switching the camera. Like if you look at Dota 2 right now, their spectator mode is just the guy clicking around with the camera. That's perfectly fine. But like a, with a shooter, you're going to need that spectator mode there. Хорошо. Давайте поблагодарим нашего спикера. Thank you. Вы всегда можете найти его за сценой и задать ваши конкретные или личные вопросы. Все, спасибо.